Obby, we're here today to talk about the planned Public Health Alcohol Act. Can you tell me first of all as to where you are coming from on this planned act? I suppose I've become interested increasingly in alcohol policy over the last decade. I was initially employed to work in the addiction service to develop a drug treatment program for, for adolescents. But it became quickly apparent, talking to teenagers with drug problems, that in an awful lot of cases it had started with alcohol, or in many cases alcohol was continuing to be a big part of the of the problem. Um, also as a doctor and as a psychiatrist, in a general sense, I suppose I was uh, encountering throughout my training and, and work as a doctor, people who'd run into issues around alcohol or had suffered me- medical or mental health problems linked to alcohol, including suicidal behaviour very frequently uh, in my time in the psychiatric emergency departments. Uh, and I suppose the other thing that brings me to it is just as a parent, um, you know, myself, my wife were sort of wondering what to do regarding my stepkids who were heading into adolescence 10 years ago. I'm also concerned about the sort of Ireland and, and, and country my my younger kids are going to be heading into as they head into adolescence now in 2017. So for all those reasons, it's given me an interest in the topic of alcohol policy and given me some sense of wanting to contribute to that discussion. Am I right in saying that there is a huge absence of publicity in the media and maybe even in the health sector as regards the damage that alcohol does? Um, I, I think yeah, there's good basis to think that. I do think things are improving a little bit recently. Um, the HSE has a new section on health and well-being and that department, although quite small, has taken an interest now in uh, alcohol policy and people may have heard uh, a number of adverts you know, reminding people of the risks and hazards associated with alcohol in terms of physical health and mental health. And there's the Ask About Alcohol uh, .ie website, which I think is a real positive development. Um, in terms of our media in general, it's been one of my concerns that we tend to edit out the role that alcohol plays in so many accidental deaths. Alcohol has a role in about one third of road traffic accidents, and I think people are fairly well aware of that, but they're probably not so well aware of the fact that alcohol also has a role in one third of deaths from drowning, one third of deaths from falls, one third of uh, deaths um, in fires indeed. So alcohol is at the background of, of of a lot of accidental deaths, and where it occurs, the media tends to gloss over the drinking and perhaps just possibly refer to the fact someone was out socialising uh, and say nothing more than that. Just to talk a bit about mental health, um, I've read the report several times at least over the years that cannabis use can cause like illnesses such as schizophrenia. Am I right in saying that the excessive use of alcohol is no less harmful? I think alcohol brings with it different harms. Um, the link between cannabis and schizophrenia is, seems a bit specific to the stimulant type substances of which cannabis is one um, and and drugs such as amphetamines or cocaine might be similarly implicated um, there isn't a link between alcohol and schizophrenia but maybe the, no no the, the mental health problems that would be more associated with alcohol would be things like depression um, and low mood and suicidal behavior um, you know, our culture sometimes inclu- encourages us to drown our sor- sorrows, you know, to, to go for a drink if you're feeling down. But I suppose my observation and the clinical experience would be that it's a bad thing to do when you're feeling down. And alcohol tends to make a bad mood worse. It can cause people to be a bit more impulsive in that situation. And you know, that can oftentimes end up in self-destructive and suicidal behaviour. Um, but as regards, like, ex- I mean, really excessive alcohol use, way over the levels. Like, if you look at violence on our streets, I think, like, I don't know what the percentage is, but how much percentage of, of violent attacks are alcohol related? Yeah, that that's certainly a huge issue with regards to alcohol, and that's where it deserves its sort of bad reputation in terms of the social harms it causes. The police would say that up to 90% of all public disorder is alcohol related and probably similar proportions of you know domestic incidents that the police are dealing with on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, alcohol is part of the picture. And indeed, we were reminded quite recently of the, the harms that children experience as a result of, of that you know excessive drinking in the home environment. In um, the recent report 
by Geoffrey Shannon, who was examining the use of, of I suppose, the, the powers of Gardaí to take children away from their parents in situations of risk, where alcohol was involved in a huge number of the stories uh, and situations that he was investigating. And it caused him again to uh, once again, I suppose, implore Irish society to do something regarding our society's relationship with alcohol, given the secondary harm that it's it's causing to children. Because the tendency for drinkers, you know, adults who drink to, to resent government intrusion via measures such as this Public Health Alcohol Act uh, into what they would see as their own choices and a sense that as individual drinkers, well, we should be able to do whatever we want, uh, which ignores the fact that there is secondary harms which are experienced by others uh, and most obviously children. Yeah, just quickly about mental health there again. Are you saying that if you drink excessively, like I mean way over the recommended uh, guidelines every week, that there is there or is there not a link with developing schizophrenia? Um, there isn't any strong link in terms of developing schizophrenia. There are, however, links with certain fairly specific and, and perhaps less common uh, mental health problems. Schizophrenia, as we know, is a really serious uh, psychiatric disorder, which is characterized by psychotic symptoms, that's hearing voices and delusions. Um, you can get uh, a, an alcohol-related hallucinosis, which is where people entirely uh, down to their drinking end up hearing voices. You can also get people who end up becoming quite paranoid uh, and it seems to be associated with alcohol. There's one syndrome called the Clarenbeau the Clarenbeau syndrome or pathological jealousy which seems to be particularly prevalent among people who drink alcohol very very heavily where they become pathologically paranoid and jealous regarding their partner. When you add that or add their ongoing drinking into that paranoia and, and pathological concern that can sometimes have fatal outcomes where, you know, um, a, a person will at, attack, assault and, and potentially even kill their partner in a jealous rage with alcohol at the background um, of both their beliefs and that final act. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a condition, I, I know, the term I have for it is the old term it went out a long time ago I think it's called wet brain it used to be called what's that? I think that's more down to the long term cognitive damage oh. that alcohol can do so it's not causing a psychiatric disorder oh. uh, in that case it's just causing damage to memory damage to cognitive functioning and there was actually a paper published in the uh, was either the British Medical Journal or the Lancet just in the last couple of months where unfortunately the bad news for those of us who drink, and that includes myself, um, is that any level of drinking was associated with a measurable degree of cognitive decline. And this was in a long-term follow-up study of adults tracked through from adolescence through into middle adulthood. And the more people drank, the more evidence there was of cognitive decline. And they measured that both by brain scans where they could see shrinkage of the hippocampus. Uh, and they also measured it via certain cognitive tests of memory. Uh, and there was evidence of damage. Uh, when that's taken to extreme, there's something, again, rare, but it's called um, uh, Korsakoff psychosis, which is more other than the psychosis is in the title um, or the name it's actually more a, a cognitive damage where the hippocampus has really been almost destroyed by drinking which causes the individual to have no ability to form new memories mm. and because they can't form new memories um, they can't tell you what they had for breakfast uh, they might be able to talk in detail about what happened 10 years ago but they have no memory of what happened yesterday mm. and it's a particularly tragic condition uh, to, to finish up talking about the, the mental health side of it, I believe, I've heard it said that um, drink, alcohol and depression are a, a lethal combination. And is it true? Like a lot of people who are depressed don't realise they're depressed. And if, if you're drinking heavily and you're depressed, you're asking for trouble. Like, Yeah, uh, both depressive disorders and anxiety disorders, um, alcohol can be uh, tempting to turn to it as a short-term fix. You know, sometimes if you're in bad form, alcohol might help your mood. But the cumulative effect of drinking on a background of depression 
is that it tends to make a bad mood worse mm. and a depression tends to become more entrenched and more persistent and even if the depression is being treated with medication or psychological therapies they tend to be much less effective if someone is drinking the same with anxiety disorders um, alcohol can give people a bit of a Dutch courage or, or, or a short term lift in their confidence and if they're socially anxious for example but it, it tends to actually aggravate anxiety symptoms mm-hmm. and withdrawals from alcohol tend to bring with them lots and lots of anxiety symptoms. Yeah, the Taoiseach spoke recently about his aspiration to denormalise alcohol in this country, uh, denormalise it as being a simple, harmless grocery product. What is your understanding of how the planned Public Health Alcohol Act would help achieve this? Yeah, I think that's probably the great mistake we've made in Ireland. Or oh, really, it's, and it's, it goes probably back to the 1990s. You know, we didn't treat alcohol as a grocery product in the 1960s, 70s or 80s. Um, it was sold in licensed premises and by and large just consumed in those licensed premises. It's now just become a normal grocery product that's all over our supermarkets, our garages, our small convenience stores. Um, and that has been associated with massive increases in alcohol consumption in Ireland now compared to say the 1960s or 1970s. We're drinking about two and a half times the quantities that we were back then. Um, And the fact that it's become so normal, so pervasive, um, and that people's drinking at home has increased so much, um, has brought with it that increase in use. Increase in use brings with it then, you know, a proportional increase in harms. So I think, you know, um, the aspiration of the act is to, yeah, to move alcohol away from that position as a normal grocery product. And if it's, while it's not, well, it will be continued to be sold in grocery stores. The plan is to have it in defined, discrete sections of grocery stores, which makes it clear to the consumer that you know it is different uh, in that regard. Um, secondly, we're not going to advertise it or permit it to be advertised in the same free uh unrestricted way most products can be advertised again showing respect for the fact that it is a a product associated with lots of harm so there'll be advertising restrictions as well so the act will will take some small steps in reversing the massive liberalization of alcohol policy that occurred in the 1990s and in the noughties yeah am i right in thinking that the planned public health alcohol act will make a big difference to the number of people developing drink problems in this country um basically what it will achieve i think it will be a reduction in alcohol consumption how big that is is hard to guess i mean the department of health's own aspiration in terms of the healthy ireland goals are to reduce our per capita alcohol consumption by about 20 percent from where it's at at the moment and what seems to be the case internationally is that if you reduce per capita consumption you know, the population level consumption by about 20%, you'll also reduce the measurable alcohol-related harms by about 20% as well. So that means probably 20% less cases of cirrhosis, 20% less cases of alcohol dependence. Do you have any sympathy for alcohol companies complaining about this planned act? I have very little sympathy for them. Where I do have some sympathy is that I know people who, who work you know, for alcohol companies, and they're they're good, decent people. Mm. And, you know, they would see people like myself and the views that are uh, been, emer- that are, have been emerging from the public health community as a threat to their employment, I guess, to some extent. You know, if alcohol, alcohol consumption does drop by 20%, uh, that probably does mean less employment in certain sectors of the either alcohol retail trade or alcohol manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to see people lose their job, but I suppose I'm a doctor, so my priority certainly is to save lives over saving jobs. Mm. Um, and I, I also guess, you know, what what they would regularly sort of say is, um, uh, you know, that there's lots of employment in the uh, generated through manufacture and retail of alcohol, and that's in jeopardy. Uh, and it's in jeopardy because people will be spending less money on drink if the, if the act is effective. But, of course... The, the, 
you know, if people are spending less money on drink, they'll be spending more money on other things. They'll be spending more money going out to restaurants or mm. spending more money going to the cinema. Mm. So that will generate employment and jobs elsewhere. Mm. It's not that the money, the money will all be sort of stuck under a mattress and never spent. It will be spent. It will maintain employment, albeit perhaps in different sectors. Uh, do you have any sympathy for the small shop owners? Um, they are probably the group of retailers I have most sympathy for, partly because actually they're fairly small, you know, they're small game when it comes to looking at who provides alcohol to the Irish people. It really is the big supermarkets uh, who sell most of it. They sell about 50 to 60 percent of the alcohol in Ireland. Uh, it's about 35 to 40 percent is sold in uh, pubs, nightclubs, bars, uh, hotels, and the re- uh, the uh, the um, the on trade sector. Um, and the actual small shops sell two or three percent. So it it does appear that they're a group who've generated a lot of uh, noise in recent months, complaining about the burden that's going to be imposed on them by the structural separation, this requirement that alcohol is is kept somewhere separate in a shop. And they've looked for compromises. Um, you know, with my sort of pure doctor hat on, I'm inclined to go, well, you know, the shops, the corner shops in Ireland survived back in the 1960s and 70s when they weren't allowed to sell uh, mm. alcohol at all. Um, it's not us who's the threat to corner shops uh, it's not this act that is the the big threat to to corner shops has been the big supermarkets and the big grocery stores and the big shopping malls Um, but that said if some compromise has to be uh, or is delivered there to that particular group given the small contribution they make to overall alcohol sales it's not going to water down the overall features of the act Mm. um but my worry would be that if a compromise is given to that small group, then the big supermarkets will then use that compromise as some, you know, some argument for getting compromises for themselves. And that I would have a huge problem with. Yeah. A lot of people seem to think that this planned act is going to increase the price of alcohol drinks. And some people think that the whole planned act is symptomatic of a nanny state government in Ireland. Is there any basis for the average person who who doesn't have a a serious drink problem to worry about this planned act, in your view? I really don't think so. Um, That... You know, the, the the one thing that might push up price of some products will be the minimum unit pricing, okay? And that's that, that component of the uh, Act is designed to set a floor below which alcohol products can't be sold. And it's only really going to have an impact on um, the uh, off-license sector who are selling really strong, extremely cheap alcohol products. So, you know, for listeners who have developed an affection for um, super strength cider that's mega cheap, they might notice that they're paying 20 or 30% more for, for their can of, of cider. Um, but for the vast, vast majority of drinkers who use other products, either in the off license sector or for those who drink in the pub trade, they're going to notice absolutely no impact whatsoever. In terms of the other bit of your question i suppose the, the, this argument about nanny state i always find really really frustrating as citizens we of course we have rights you know we can choose to uh, expose ourselves to risky behaviors um, we don't all have to eat healthily we don't all have to drink healthily and of course this act won't stop you from drinking in an unhealthy way it'll just make it a little bit less convenient for you to do so it'll also make it a little bit more costly if you do drink really high strength alcohol products and and why though does the state have a right or i would argue a duty to do that it's because we live in a society where people expect to be picked up when they fall down we live in a society where people expect decent quality and cheap or free health service so as citizens if we're expecting you know the government or, or you know our fellow citizens to, to pick us up when we hit times of difficulty for me it's therefore entirely reasonable and indeed right that government and wider society would seek to intrude on the decision making of 
individuals regarding how often they engage in unhealthy behaviours, given that it's wider society that picks up the cost, mm-hmm. or some of that cost. It doesn't all fall down to the individual. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also this is issue of secondary harm. You know, non-drinkers have to deal with a lot of the harm generated by drinkers. That can sometimes be a spouse, it can be a child, it can be a parent. So this idea that drink only affects the drinker and therefore we shouldn't be intruding on the individual drinker isn't true. So you're saying, and it's what Ewan McKinney from Alcohol Action Ireland said to me recently, the MU, the medium unit pricing is not going to increase the price of a pint in pubs, restaurants, uh, hotels, that kind of stuff. And even in supermarkets that have specials on like 24 cans for whatever, is it not going to affect them wider? It's just the very extremely cheap stuff. It's certainly not going to have any impact on the on-trade sector. That's the hotels, nightclubs off and bars. Um, in terms of will it have an impact in terms of supermarkets, um, in terms of the specials, mm. it might. You know, I see Super Value at the moment is selling bottles of Budweiser for 80 cent sure. a bottle. Mm. You know, you can't get a bottle of water for 80 cent mm. in, in Super Value. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not that will be below the threshold. To some extent, it depends where the government puts the threshold. There's probably mm. about one and a half units of alcohol in a bottle of Budweiser. Um, and I think they're talking about a, a, a 50 cent minimum unit price, which would mean that it would mean they couldn't sell it below 75 cent. So even you know those super cheap deals, which I think are unbelievably cheap, mm. Most of those will probably go untouched. It's probably the on you know the the, the brands that most people wouldn't recognise, mm. and the brands that do tend to be chosen by the heaviest drinkers and the youngest drinkers who are just looking for maximum hit for minimum cost. It's those groups and the products they choose that are most likely to be impacted, which to me makes it a more logical approach as well because they're the groups we want to impact. We want to impact the young drinkers and the heaviest drinkers. Yeah, a lot of people need to hear that information, I think, you know. Okay, okay, Bobby, it's great talking to you. I hope to cover the act again soon. Hopefully it'll be bought in through the Oireachtas soon, so I'll be covering it on the other side of being legislated for. So it's great talking to you today, so I'll be talking to you again at some stage. Thanks very much, right? Thank you very much, Darren.